am supposed to be doing a presentation with Liz Harris. We have taken a little bit of license. We have decided that we are just going to mix it up a little bit. We're going to do a bit of division. Liz is going to talk to us about this topic of uh, behavioural economics, influence, manipulation, coercion. I'm not sure whether it's because you're better at those things, Liz, than I am. No, I can work the technology. You can. Don't we know that? <laughs> I'm going to do something a little bit different. I hope that there's some integrity between what I'm about to share with you and what Liz will share with you. We'll let you be the judge. Rory Sutherland says in his book, Alchemy, that sometimes two plus two doesn't equal four. The implication is that it could potentially be more than four. So when we get to the end of our presentations, you can make an assessment of whether the sum is more than four. We're going to give you a service guarantee that if it's less than four, you get your money back. Okay? I'm going to talk to you about why I'm here. And when I say why I'm here, I don't mean why I'm working on walking on planet Earth, and I don't mean why I'm standing here in front of you today. I mean why I'm at this Eurosage symposium. And there are lots of potential answers. It could be because Geelong in spring is lovely. Just look outside. <laughs> It could be because I hope to be wearing a blue polo shirt. That is not the reason that I'm here. It could be that I hope to be stimulated and that I would learn a lot by being in this forum. And that's certainly correct. That was a hope of mine. But it's actually not why I am here. The reason I am here is because of trust. Trust comes out of an expectation that a person, a company, a product or service, or perhaps a brand, will deliver an outcome for us. Trust can be generated over a long period of time, perhaps years sometimes, perhaps in an hour, but it can also be generated in a moment can be generated in a breath, or a heartbeat, or a conversation. In 2011, just before I went to my first VeraSage Symposium in Las Vegas, Moore's, the legal practice where I work, had been tinkering with value pricing for about 12 months. And John Chisholm, bless his heart, he asked me if I would go to Las Vegas for the Virasage Symposium. <coughs> he trusted me that I would not disgrace Australia and I would not disgrace uh, the, the purpose of value pricing down under. And to an extent, I trusted him as well that I wouldn't be thrown into the lion's den. Or that if I was, I would be protected. And it was an entirely enriching experience for me. I learned so much. I learned that knowledge is a non-rival asset. I learned that it's okay to say no to some clients because of Baker's Law. Bad clients drive out good clients. I'm a bit of a language nut and I was so excited to learn that all transformations are linguistic first. And I learned that clients love it when we share risk with them. So I encountered a whole lot of strange people with different ideas. And they did something that was very, very important for me. They trusted me to come back to Australia as an ambassador with these ideas and to share them. I was enriched by that experience and those close to me say that I was also a little bit evangelical about it.
Stephen Covey says that trust is the cement that keeps the building blocks together. And I believe that. And the building blocks are things like the needs of a client, the needs that a client may have of us as providers of solutions, the expectations that clients have about the way we might deliver those solutions, and the representations or promises that we make to clients about how that might be done. And we do that in subtle ways. And so in a value pricing context, context we might do that uh, by giving a free sample. And so if we're practicing in the classically correct way, if there is a correct way, we'll have a value conversation with the client and which will unpack what it is that the client's trying to achieve, what the issues are, and how we might create value. But we might get to the end of that conversation and find that we can't create value. And if there's no retainer as a result of that, then we're not going to charge a fee. We've been prepared to perhaps share some information with the client, but we haven't actually hopefully given away the solution, but the conversation might still have been valuable to the client. We've made an investment in the potential client. That builds trust. We share risk with clients when we price for value as well. We fix a fee up front and against other means of assessment about what might be a right or wrong fee, and we won't make any mention of what those other means of assessment might be, our fee that we agreed up front might be too low, but we share risk with the client and that builds trust. And then there are value adds. If we go to dinner at a restaurant and we have a nice time and the, uh, the, the host enjoys our company and wants to encourage us to come back, she might offer us a free digestive, an armagnac or a grapper or something. And that's an encouragement to us and it builds trust. Similarly, in our practices, we might be able to give clients a bit of a value add as well. That might be something like, when there is scope creep, we won't actually say to the client, I need to charge you a little bit more for doing this extra piece of work. We will allow that to go through to the keeper, do the little bit of extra work, and hopefully point out to the client that that was our intention. Make it clear that there is a value add, and it's coming at no fee, and that builds trust. Our service guarantee, if we give one, builds trust as well. And if we ever get called on a service guarantee, hopefully that doesn't happen very often. If we're not too defensive about engaging with the client and listening carefully to what the client says about how the service that we delivered didn't match what we agreed up front, and then we resolve that dispute quickly, then that can build trust as well. In his book, Alchemy, Rory Sutherland calls these sorts of examples. <clears throat> Continuity, probability, signaling. It's a mouthful. But he says it means trust because we are signaling the probability of the continuation of a relationship. We make an investment in our potential customer by doing these sorts of things because we want to have an ongoing relationship with them. They build trust. Last year, I went to, uh, to Europe with some members of my family. We were in Paris for four or five days. It was overlapping with the World Cup soccer. And we were privileged to be there when France was playing Uruguay in the quarterfinal. And we wanted to watch the quarterfinal, but I couldn't work out how to make the television in the Airbnb work, and, and Liz is nodding her head, no wonder. <laughs> so we decided we'd go to a bar uh, or a, a, 
a cafe, and there were plenty in our street, but most of them were chopped, chock full, packed to the rafters, a lot of tourists, but we found a little pub just around the corner, and it was where there were only locals. We walked in, and I tried to speak a little bit of French, probably made no impression, but they looked at my charming wife and my 21-year-old daughter, and graciously invited us in, gave us a seat, shifted someone out of the seat, and they actually made a real fuss of us. Rory Sutherland says that uh, in talking about continuity probability signalling, an example is a tourist restaurant and a local pub. You go to a tourist restaurant, you expect to pay a bit more, expect to be surrounded by tourists, and the experience may not be so great. You go to a local pub, and it's for locals, yeah. the prices are a bit lower, the food may not be terrific, but people keep coming back, and that's because the patron of the local pub wants the repeat service and makes an investment in it. The patron of the local pub wants to build trust, whereas the patron of the tourist restaurant knows that he or she is never going to see that customer again in all probability. What happened for me in that pub in Paris is that the patron treated me and my wife and my daughter like locals. He trusted us. And when tr someone trusts you, it's like giving you a precious gift. We have this opportunity in our practices to trust and to be trusted. They're around us all the time. Trust is a predictive indicator. If you need a legal service and you don't know a lawyer, you might ask a friend who's had a good experience with someone and they might say, go and see David, he helped me in a similar situation, he did a good job. You don't trust me yet, I've only got a reputation but you do trust your friend, and there is referred trust there. It is a prediction of how the potential client might be able to relate to me, whereas reputation is a lagging indicator. It is looking only at backward-facing data. <coughs> Innovation needs the trust of our people forward-looking. If we can build trust with our people as Tina is building with the people in her team, and she talked to us about that yesterday, that can make for compelling relationships, better productivity, and incredible innovation in the practice. But without trust, we can't expect to have innovation in our practices. So why am I here? I am here because eight years ago, the people in the Virasage community were prepared to trust me. When they showed trust of me, they gave me a precious gift. And I was very happy to bring that back to Australia and share it with others. And I hope that they have uh, been enriched by that gift of trust as well. When I go back to Melbourne, <laughs> I am going to return to my local pub. The name of my local pub is Value Pricing 1.0. I'll be frequenting that pub for a very long time. It's a place where I can give and receive trust. So much as I say, I'm just checking that I can use technology, and I've been mocking my co-founders and directors, you know, who I think 
actually I really only had me on board because I do I can break the technology. How does utilising behavioural economics tie into David's talk? Um, it is that issue about are we actually potentially breaching the trust of our clients in utilising behavioural economics in our proposals, in our discussions with our clients and so forth. So I'm going to touch on that. We haven't had a value conversation, so I am making assumptions that you all have a general understanding about behavioural economics. And I'm terribly sorry if you don't, because we're going to run through this fairly quickly. Um, here are some of the heuristics and biases that we are subject to when we make decisions on a day-to-day -day basis. And Governments have recognised that they can um, work with those heuristics and biases to nudge our decision making. The UK government set up a nudge unit, it's known as the nudge unit, I think it's the behavioural economics unit, in fact they've now, um, it's, it's now a private enterprise. Um, to look at the way they can actually influence the decisions of uh, British taxpayers. We have the same thing in Australia. Uh, multiple um, countries around the world are now using nudges to, they would say, help people make better decisions. How do nudges work? They can work in different ways. So they can be used to actually provide more information to people to enable them to make better decisions. It can be the way you actually present choices to people, so you make the choice easier. It can be suggesting the preferred path to make the decision easier. So it's, it's, a, it's a path of least resistance. In some instances, it's simply providing a default which overcomes that issue about inertia and procrastination. And sometimes it's by, it's by using social influences. You've probably all, in fact, here is a nudge. Anyone see this in their room this morning? Okay, it's pretty standard for hotel rooms nowadays. You know, leave your towels in the bath or the tub if you want us to wash them, but otherwise we're nudging you really reduce our costs by not having you have to not having to wash your towels, but we're nudging you in a social way by talking about uh, acting here, Planet 21, your towels plant trees. Right. We see nudges all the time and most of the time we are unaware that we are being subject to nudges. Now there's many people and you know, we heard Ron yesterday. Uh, you know, to talk about behavioural economics is not really something he's terribly excited about. And sometimes you could say it was almost the emphasis on clothes because you look at some of the nudges and you know some of the heuristics and biases and think, well, oh, marketing has been doing that for years. Tim, you know, probably it, it's really a matter of sort of common sense and where is it really this revelation that economists have now recognised that we don't make rational choices. Richard Thaler, Nobel Prize winner, behavioural economist, um, talks about and justifies the use of nudges as being libertarian paternalism. In other words, we are allowing people to make choices but the paternalistic approach is helping them make choices in the right way, helping them make better choices. So here are a couple of examples of questions. Now, Marcel, I can't pronounce this. Can you pronounce? All the <laughs> As I understand it, this is a rubbish bin in a park in Holland. Uh, 
Well, it seems to be very good to think. I just did that on Tuesday I had the demonstration the demonstration of urinals at Chipol Airport and the nudges there. You can ask me about it if you don't know about it. But when you walk past this little statue, it calls out in Dutch, paper here, paper here, eat me. Yeah. And it um, and the mouth opens and closes, so it closes. So you know, the incentive is to actually put your rubbish into uh, the mouth. The British tax system. These four different letters were sent to taxpayers whose taxes were overdue. And if we look at it, you know, the second one is that social peer pressure. It's sort of the positive um, approach. The third one is a negative approach. You know, and the last one is very much along the lines of the hotel's nudge, you are doing good for the community. Depending on which approach there was, the increase in people responding immediately and paying their taxes was 15% between the top and the bottom. Line. I recently uh, had a family member in hospital uh, and noticed in the canteen at the Alfred Hospital that it, 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 when I say it's a canteen, it's, it's basically a food mount with different suppliers. But at each supplier, on each food item, there was a red, green, orange. Um, and signs there telling you, you know, eat not quite as much green as you want, but eat, eat green, orange is something you have occasionally and read something you really don't have very much. So it was that prompt to make me make a healthy choice. Any any ideas why I've got this up as examples of lunches? Yeah, the way you set out, but you can't find the exit. <laughs> Anyone ever been lost to like here? I have going around in circles. You know, Crown Casino, don't have clocks. There's no daylight. You don't know what time it is. And these are all psychological nudges. Studies have shown that candy in a green wrapper is seen as more healthy. <laughs> you know, if you want any demonstration about the fact that we are not rational in the way we actually do. Now, Thaler says, you know, the design should be transparent and not misleading and easy to opt out of. Um, you know, they are driven by the belief that the behaviour should be encouraged will improve the welfare of those being managed. So when we come to looking at using nudges in the way we lay out proposals or the way we present information to our clients, do we, do we get to a point where we're Crown Casino and Ikea and perhaps Green Rapids as opposed to Health and Food and British Tax System and Health? This slide, and I'm not going to go through it in detail, just gives you an indication of the sort of heuristics and biases that are in play at the different points in purchasing behaviour, in, in a purchasing decision. Okay. You know, the time of the price motivation, the perception of that price, and then the decision behaviour itself. Vocalis are an international pricing agency and they have studied uh, about 20,000 purchasing decisions over the last nine years. And they classify purchases into these five different categories. Now, there's many different ways of, of, of classifying people when they are making purchasing decisions. But I thought for today it would be interesting to sort of run through these. And I'm sure some of them ring true for you. The bargain hunter. You know, we've all had the bargain hunter. I don't think we need to explain that. Um, you know, one way that you actually frame your um, proposition for a bargain hunter client is framing it as a bargain. 
it is presenting the price as discounts. And I know the, the D word is a terrible word, but from a bargain hunter's perspective, that's simply what they're looking for. You know, many people would say procurement fall into that bargain hunter uh, category. Um, the risk avoider. The risk avoider goes for the safe option. Cheap is not always a good deal. And one of the challenges for risk avoiders in professional services is often they simply make no decision. Sometimes they actually choose to do nothing, even though it's perfectly clear that that's not the best outcome for them. So they're looking to whether there's a safer alternative. And this is where David's discussion about trust comes into play, because if you can establish trust, you mitigate that concern about risk. Service guarantees are a great way of mitigating that concern. But another option is a pay per use scenario, if you're able to offer that, because it's almost a, a, a test before I buy, a test before I commit. Then you have the price acceptor, where price is not an issue and they're buying on quality, not price. So they'll pay more if they can justify the value that they're seeing in the service. So in this instance, this is the classic example where you're using options and you are anchoring them initially to a higher price with greater value and uh, relying on the bias where it's difficult for people to actually take something away. It's the endowment approach. Once they actually see something that they have there, then it's difficult for them to say, I don't want that aspect of the service. And then we all know the Apple buyer, the loyalty buyer. Um, one of the challenges I think we have as professionals is recognising uh, when a client is coming to us, testing us out, but they're really a loyalty buyer and they actually are going to stay with their current supplier. Uh, and certainly in procurement, often that's the case, that they're required to, you know, a corporation is required to go out to market, but they really have no great desire to move from whoever their current suppliers are. When do you stop wasting your time? Retainers and subscription, you know, the retainer subscription model. And sorry, could I just say something here? <coughs> Diverge slightly. Um, we've got a little bit of a um, linguistic challenge between the Australians in the room and I think the Americans. Because, particularly for the Australian lawyers, we see retainers as effectively what Ed is talking about with subscriptions as opposed to a payment at the outset to secure your services. Um, so, sorry, just need to <laughs> clarify that. Yeah. So we all knew that we were sort of, when we're talking about subscriptions, I think for a lot of us, Australian lawyers, we see that as, as retainers. And then we have the indifferent buyer, who doesn't care about price. You know, they are more concerned about avoiding the additional effort um, if they like what you offer. It's cost versus convenience. I often tell the story about, I would argue that no work is truly commoditised and I tell a personal story about a, a, a conveyancing situation I was in. We were selling a property um, and I had retained a lawyer um, for various reasons that probably didn't sell. Um, and nine months later, someone knocked on the door and offered us a great price that said he wanted to be a property developer and he wanted to settle, uh, to sign the contract within a week, otherwise he was going to make an offer on another property. I never did convey and see when I was practicing. So to all intents and purposes, I was a lone client. And I rang the lawyer I'd previously used because I didn't know whether he actually could prepare the contract in that short period of time. And the law firm was totally non-responsive. Um, they eventually got back to me, and yes, it went through. And then we purchased another property, and things went bad. You know, they, they continued to be non-responsive. So I sacked them and moved to a different lawyer. 
and it was an entirely different scenario. I know it was all automated, but within 10 minutes of my initial email instructing them, I got an email back confirming instructions, telling me what was going to happen and when and what I had to do and what their expectations, the information they needed from me. And then, two days later, in the mail, I got an envelope that had um, a form that enabled me to change my voting registration, the form that enabled me to transfer my car registration, a moving checklist, you know, and I information about how to change my utility supplies, none of which is legal services, but boy, it saved me a heap of time. And would I have paid more for that service? You betcha. Because in, I was an indifferent buyer. You know, any increase in convenience to me was going to be significant. <coughs> so, you know, we don't think about this. Where is that line between nudging to help our clients make a better decision? and nudging them perhaps to make an ill-informed, uninformed decision. I'm not providing the answer to that today, so I don't think I can. You know, perhaps does the end define the ethics of the nudge? And perhaps it's simple with Crown Casino that the end is to keep people gambling and most people would think that that's not a good thing. But I'll leave you with that to do that today. Thank you.